All right. I am excited about today's message. We're going to be talking about money matters. And I find it ironic that if you look at our U.S. currency, you'll find in God we trust printed on the bills. Isn't that ironic sometimes? Because we have a tendency to sometimes trust this over God. Furthermore, when you think about this, I mean, this is one of the things that create a lot of conflict. One of the number one reason that couples get divorced is because they can't agree about this. One of the reasons we have so much crime, it's over this. It's a battle for this. It's the reason we, we want power. This gives power. This gives us security. And we know that the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And it's, it's all about why we want this. Because all of us would probably say, yeah, I could use a little more of this. I could use a little more of this. I'm assuming you could use a little more of this as well. So we're going to talk about money matters. Matthew 6.24 says that we can only serve one master. And usually it's between God and money, your mammoth it talks about, meaning that these material things of the world, are we going to serve God wholeheartedly so that our worship is pure before God? Or are we going to give in money we trust a shot and pursue it? Even if whether we have it or we don't, we can still make it an idol in our life. So we're going to talk about that. To set us up, I want to do a few things to prepare us for this message. I want to talk about principles, promises, and plans so we understand the difference. Because Proverbs is filled with a lot of principles, a couple of promises, and we need to make the plan. So here is a principle. A principle, principles are guiding ideas that inform other ideas. These are typically universal things. Like if you don't get enough sleep, you're going to be tired. So there's a principle of I need to rest. If you smile more, then that's more contagious. That's a principle. In general, people who are happier or have that presence in general create a better environment. Those are all ideas of principles. They're universal across the board. A promise, promises are guaranteed typically related to, to the future. The promises are from God as it relates to studying the book of Proverbs. Romans 10 talks about whoever, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. We can trust in that. Now, context always informs the promises, but promises are always true in the right context. Even promises like, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall experience persecution. Praise the Lord. You can claim that promise. <laughs> Those are promises. Those are things that are always true, and typically it's down the road. Now, a plan is our action step. And what I want to see us do this morning is that we would recognize and have wise plans built on principles by trusting God's promises. And I hope you can do this. I hope you can do this this morning as it relates to finances, because principles are universal for everybody. Promises are from God's, but plans are going to be up to us. What are we going to do with God's principles as we trust God's promises? So this morning, I'm going to talk about money matters. Here's an illustration I like to use. I usually use pool noodles. I couldn't find any, so I use, I grabbed uh, these super soakers. So if you're looking sleepy this morning, I'll wake you up. So uh, here's how I illustrate this in premarital counseling, and I've shared it here a few times. There's three areas that you need to, to have an idea on as it relates to money matters. One is what is your income? So let's just say this green one is the income line. What are you making? What are you going to do with what you make? What is the income? The other one is the expense line. Where, where is it? How close is it to the income line? And the third area is the margin, the space in between. And so if your income is here and you're spending like this, then you're going to be stressed. And a lot of us with credit cards and so forth, we can actually <laughs> spend more than we make. And so what I want to do this morning is I want you to have a, I want you to have a plan. <laughs> Never thought I'd be doing this in church. <laughs> I want you to have a plan that says, how do I honor God with my income? How do I honor God with my expenses? And how do I honor God with the margin in between? Getting on the same page in these areas is what I would, when doing premarital counseling, I'm like, you need to know this. You need to know what your income is. You need to know what your expenses are. And you need to know what you're going to do with the margin. And if you figure that out, that's the plan that I want you to work on based on understanding God's principles 
in God's promises. So let's jump in. We're going to talk about first fruits in Proverbs. The first proverb we're going to look at is Proverbs 3. It says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now, first of all, I want you to understand the context of when this was written, and then we'll talk about what it looks like today. You need to recognize that most of these proverbs uh, are going to be related to agricultural ideas because this is an agricultural age when this was written. And so this is what people were producing crops and all these things. And then a harvest would come and they would offer the first fruits of their produce. And actually, when God's people were led into the promised land, into Israel, when they got there, one of the things that they did was when they planted their own vineyards and they produced their own crops, they had this offering of first fruits. They're like, hey, we recognize that God brought us into a promised land. He provided for us. And as an offering back, we offer these first fruits back to God. Another thing that it accomplished is it was provision for the priests. A priest of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Levi, were filled with priests. And these priests didn't have an agricultural job like the rest of the Israelites. And so the first fruits would also help provide for the priests. If you look at Ezekiel 44 and 30, it says this. First of all, First fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind from all your contributions shall be for the priest. And you shall also give to the priest the first of your dough to cause a blessing uh, to the rest of your house. Now, dough is not slang for money, as you might think. It's actual <laughs> food, dough, the flour. They would, they would need this stuff and, and give it away. And so it was very much for provision for the priest. Uh, and these were... Command. Now, we recognize that today that we live in a different context in this. And even Paul, when he was preaching to the Jews, he was very much, you know, the workman's worthy of his, uh, the labor. You, you know, you don't tread, or, uh, muzzle the ox that treads the grain that some of the parables and proverbs mentioned in the New Testament about, yes, give someone uh, finances to help provide for the ministry. But Paul saw Paul also, when he was ministering to the Greeks, did tent making work because he recognized that the people he was ministering to may not have the same views. So ministry context matters. But this was a means of provision. On a side note, it's important to understand that this was very different from the tithe. The tithe means a tenth was also something that the Israelites did or the 12 tribes did to provide for the Levites as well. But this was a different, this was the first fruits. So let's throw this parable over top of our grid real quick to see if we got it. So the principle behind this is that we would honor God with our first fruits, meaning that we would recognize and give God our best. Recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. And the principle is, is that I learned to honor God with those first fruits. The promise is that God will provide for those who honor him. And I'll, I'll mention this in a minute. Prosperity gospel have distorted this. And I'll talk about this in just a minute. But there is a promise that God provides for us when we honor him. And the plan is, is what we do about the principle. What are we going to, are we going to give as to the Lord? Are we going to give the first fruits of our time, our money, our services? And how we, the big question is, is how do we give back to God this life that he gave us in the first place? What's that look like? And as a pastor who is a recipient of people who give to the church, let me just say that I am not excluded from the principle or having a plan to trust the promise that I too, as well as everybody who's alive, should have a sense to where I'm trusting God and I'm giving as to the Lord. So what might this look like today for some people? For some people, again, separate from a tithe, it's a sense to say, hey, I'm going to, I'm selling my business or I'm retiring and I'm going to give a portion of that to the church or to charity or uh, some people give first fruits of their uh, tax return if you get one. But, but whatever it looks like, some people have, have ways that they do that. I want to give to the Lord. I got some extra income and inheritance or whatever and I'm going to give first fruits to the Lord. Uh, the New Living Translation says it this way. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grains and your vats will overflow with good wine. 
The idea is that God wants our best and we recognize God provided things for us. And so we want to give back to the Lord first, prioritize God first with the industry that my life produces. I want to honor God with that. And this has been distorted for prosperity gospel. I thought about going into this, but I'm like, I could 15 minute tangent on my frustration with prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is all about God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. And God does, but it gets distorted. And here's my biggest, I'll just share one thing, my biggest frustration with it. Instead of making honoring God the focus and who God is, it makes us the focus and what we can accumulate in this, on this earth. And I think that's probably the biggest frustration or problem that I have because it doesn't make it about honoring God, which is the key to the principle. It makes it about how I can build and advance my kingdom on this earth versus God. So I think that that is a bad distortion of why we should give. We don't give because we want more. We give because of who he is. Proverbs 13, the get rich quick scheme, verse 11 says, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And keep in mind, this was written at a time where there weren't a lot of opportunities to get rich quick. You know, you pretty much had to grind it out. You worked all day just so you could eat and do long. We think about how a busy day is today. Yeah, I had to go grocery shopping. I had to wash clothes, you know, all these things. Imagine how long it took back then. So this was a, a time where if you did get rich quick, Chances are there was dishonest gain behind it. You manipulated, you robbed, you stole something. You did not earn it. You, you got it dishonestly. And this is a proverb that warns against that. Uh, I just read an article. Reader's Digest uh, is November 10th, 2022. So this was last November. And it was a, an article that mentioned whether, you, uh, whether it was 500 million or 1 million, people who won the lottery... 70% of them lost the entirety of what they won in five years or less. 70% of people, whether it was $500 million or $1 million that won the lottery, lost it in less than five years. And this is why, because get-rich-quick schemes don't equip you to how to manage money well. And it's evident in the lives of the people who do get it quickly. Le the process teaches us how to manage money better. And so we need to be better equipped. Now let me share my testimony a little bit related to finances. Because I grew up in Southern West Virginia. I grew up where the pastors didn't get paid. There's not a lot of money. In 1997, I think the medium income in Logan County where I grew up was like $19,700 or something like that, less than $20,000. There was not a lot of wealth in Logan County and there still isn't. I grew up going to churches and people just kind of dropped a dollar in here and there and I didn't learn much about giving. And I got married when I was 27 to a wonderful young lady, Chrissy, and I will tell you, I thought of myself as mature. I read my Bible every day. I went to church three times a week. I shared my faith. I had led people to the Lord. But I never gave because I felt like I never had money to give and I didn't have a good example around me. There was I believed all these things. I was trying to live my life to honor God. But I'll be honest with you, I, the reason I didn't give is because I never felt like I had money to give. And my wife slapped me around figuratively. <clears throat> I think I could take her. If it's, not, but the, <laughs> it's even worse. I'm digging a hole deeper. Uh, <laughs> she's the one that's like, listen, 10% of this doesn't even belong to us. This is going to the Lord. And I'm like, you know, we were just starting out in marriage. And, and long story short, she helped me get my perspective right on giving. And we started giving to the Lord first before I even considered. And let me tell you what it did for me. It helped equip me to budget because I was making less money, so to speak. I had to learn that principle, that step of faith begin to equip me, what it did for me in terms of appreciating what I had and learning how to uh, do finances better, equipped and prepared me for the future. And so that's why the get, get rich quick schemes never work because the people who do get the money don't know how to manage money well. And the biblical principles 
teach us processes that will help us be better prepared for managing money. And one of that is giving to the Lord and not doing a get-rich-quick scheme. Another one, Proverbs 20, the I deserve mentality. I was going to read just verse 21, but I'm going to read verse 20 as well. It says, if one curses his father and his mother, his lamp will be put into utter darkness. An inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Now, quick money seems like a blessing at times, but it can be a curse. And, you know, as a pastor, I've learned how inheritance and things can really divide families if there's not discussion about what happens. Proverbs warns us about the dangers of getting money too quickly without the character of dealing with what we've received. And so at the time, at this time, it was responsibility of adult children to take care of their parents because they were typically, if they were elderly, and again, they didn't have all the modern uh, nursing homes, assisted living programs and, and help things. And so it was the parents' responsibility to take care of their aging parents. And, and if they did not, it was disgraceful. And this would be as if someone would say, well, I'm going to neglect my parents because they have an inheritance and I want that inheritance. And so instead of helping take care of their parents, they're after that. Matter of fact, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees in Mark 7 for this idea called Corbin. The Pharisees were, people would come to church with gifts. Here's a gift, uh, a Corbin, a gift to the, as to the Lord. And Jesus was like, but but you're not honoring your father and your mother. Instead of taking care of them, you gave all the money to the church. And the Pharisees were like, yeah, just keep giving money. And Jesus was like, you are negating the honor your father and mother principle in order to do a man-made tradition or this idea, uh, you know, of, of giving as to the Lord when you're not honoring me in that. There's a movie, uh, I've talked about this movie before. I, I thought it was a really good movie. It's a couple years old called The Ultimate Gift. I highly recommend the movie. It's not a Christian movie, but The Ultimate Gift, um, we even showed it at a, a movie night here at the church a couple of years back. James Garner plays a billionaire who, who passes away early on in the movie, and it starts out, they're around this table, and it's the reading of the will, and who gets the inheritance and all that, and James Garner's character, this billionaire, He's got a video of him talking to his family, and basically he's like, his family, y'all get nothing out of it. And his family, keep in mind, they're spoiled, they're entitled, they're just greedy, uh, money-hungry family. And there's the grandson, who's an adult. He, that's his picture there, and, they, and they're like, uh, he's like, I, I will give you the ultimate gift written into the inheritance if you do a series of tasks. But he doesn't know what he has to do, and he doesn't know what the ultimate gift is. And through the course of the movie, you're discovering the grandfather who passed away is trying to teach him what matters most in life, like work ethic and, and, and things like that. And he learns the process of what really matters most because he is spoiled and entitled. He's, everything's been handed to him his whole life. And I won't spoil the movie, but what basically has to happen is he loses the I deserve it mentality. And the, the bottom line about money is this, is, is to learn not to focus on what we can get from others as it, as it comes to making money. I don't want you to become someone at the church and be like, my main goal is how I can get money from others. That mindset will lead you to selfishness, greediness, and won't honor God. Another proverb, Proverbs 15, talks about selfishly greedy people. It says, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. So here's a question I want you to ask in your own heart. Think about this. Do you know the why behind why you want money? And this is, I would love to have more money, but is the why behind it because I want more comfort and more security? Is maybe in place of the faith you should have in God because you really want to have more comfort and security? Is it power? I want more power. Is it because I really want to help more people? Or is it because I just have personal interests? There are things that I want and, and I really want that. I have a close friend I grew up with. He called me a couple years back with a very, very difficult dilemma. He called me because he has a mother who had a gambling problem. And she got online and she found these gambling websites and she maxed out her credit cards. Then 
She took credit cards out in her adult children's names and maxed them out as well. Now he's calling me because mom has ruined him financially and he doesn't know what to do about it. He's torn. Do I turn my mother in or do I get stuck with all this financial debt that I didn't create? What do I do? Terrible dilemma to be in. Terrible spot. And I'll say this as a, just an aside. Uh, on a side note, in situations like that, because maybe you feel like you can relate, you have a story that's similar. That's an awful scenario. I don't know. What do you do in a scenario like that? I will tell you that my advice will be nine out of ten times, do not enable the person. Let them experience the consequences of their poor decision. It will, they won't feel like you love them or care about them, but nine out of ten times, the thing to do is turn them in or let them hit rock bottom because if, if you look at people who have recovered from different things, it's usually because they've hit rock bottom or experienced the consequences of their actions. If you protect people from the consequences of their actions, whether it's drug addiction or whatever, chances are they're gonna, you're going to enable them and they're never going to get out of it. So that's a little aside, but um, I think it's important. So here's some things. I want to revisit uh, some principles with my, with my guns and, uh, and then wrap up with one more proverb. Do you know why you're producing expense or uh, your income? Is your focus, I'm trying to make money because I want to honor God with this income? What does your plan look like? Is it, I need, to, I need a greater income? I need to give the first fruits of my income? I need to learn to, to give as to the Lord with the things that I make? Or is it related to expenses? Probably most of us would do well to say, one of the things I need to do is reduce expenses. I need, to, I need to spend less. I need to cancel a few subscriptions. I need to do some things that, that drop this to create more margin. And if you're way up here and you're expending, you're, cut up your credit cards, get rid of the, if you're exp- spending more than you are uh, making, you need to do that. But, but ask, what's my plan for reducing expenses? And then ask yourself, what, am I do, what do I want to do with the margin? What is this? Is this trips? Is this savings? Is this... You got to figure out what is your plan for your income, what is your plan for expense, and what is your plan for the margin. I'll say this with a financial peace summary. We took a class a couple years ago, and I remember in 2000 doing the uh, Crown Finances. It would say this. It would say the first thing you want to do in your income, in terms of your baby steps, is save $1,000 right out the gate. So save $1,000 for your emergency fund, and then pay off your debt. So if, you, if you're spending a bunch of money on debt, early on, just uh, debt snowball, it calls it, like it's throw your car payments, any credit card debt, try to get it paid off as much as you can. And so you're, what you're doing is eventually you're paying that here. So once it's paid off, you have greater margin because you've paid off all these extra expenses. And then you want to save three to six months salary in case, uh, in case there's an emergency. Cars break down. There, there are emergencies that happen. It's life. It will eventually happen. These first three steps are very, very difficult. They, call, they require sacrifice. They require time. Then the other side of that, you got steps four through seven. Four through seven is when you're investing in your income for retirement. You're saving for your children's college fund. You're paying off your home early, hopefully, and then you could live with a sense of financial freedom where you can build wealth and give generously to people. So to be a wise steward, I'm not suggesting that if you are neglecting areas of your life that you should give a bunch of money to the church. I would actually say that's not good stewardship. Take care of the responsibilities of things that God's called you to, whether it's family, whatever. Prepare yourself financially so that you can be more generous later in life by implementing these financial steps. Last proverb, and I'm going to pray. Proverb 28 says this, A stingy man hastens after wealth and does not know the poverty will come upon him. A greedy man stirs up strife, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the finances that you've provided for us at this church that we've been able to give over $200,000 to the Great Commission Fund. It's because people were generous and they want to see your name glorified throughout the earth. Lord, protect us from being stingy. Search our hearts for greed as we know that can only be replaced with generosity. 
God, help us to trust in your principles, trust in your promises, and that we would have a plan that honors you and our income and our expenses and what we do with the margin. Lord, would you be the Lord of our life, the Lord of our finances? God, protect us from being pharisaical. Protect me from having wrong motives. Lord, protect us. Would we be generous? Would you be the Lord of all areas of our life? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.